Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. My name is Gabe. And my name is Jeff. And we're going to answer your questions today. But first, I have a question, Jeff. Uh huh. How are you doing today? Uh, pretty good. Um, well, today we are recording during the daylight hours. <laughs> yes, yes, it's crazy that. Uh, just a moment ago, you were complaining that the light was yeah, was yeah. Like, I'm like eyes. my eyes are like watering for some reason. I'm like, what the heck is going on? I don't understand. What like, is that glowing ball off in the distance? <laughs> yeah, which is a joke because it's it's seriously overcast. Yeah, today. it's overcast, but I mean, it's like it's a big white like the you know white sky. So I don't, like I guess my eyes are just watering because like I'm usually in a dark yeah. basement <laughs> most of my day or in like you know so it's so the bright light is. Uh, hurting my eyes yeah so yeah i've got uh my my work is uh changing things up for the next couple weeks so mm. um so we're recording on a different day different time yeah and uh yeah it should be should be pretty good i think yeah i think uh, yeah i don't think it should make a huge difference we've, we've recorded during the daylight before a couple times yeah yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so we'll see how it goes sure i just start melting midway <laughs> oh no jeff <laughs> uh but yeah other other than that like uh for me Things are going pretty good. Mm-hmm. I, I yesterday I worked my last day at my previous job location, and mm-hmm. starting tomorrow I'm going to be somewhere else. You're gonna, you're, you're, did you like tear up as you waved goodbye to all the machines? No, not really. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think beforehand I thought I might. I thought it might be some sort of like a sentimental thing. I mean, I've, I've been there for like almost three years. It's mm-hmm. not, it's not like I've been there my whole life or anything. Right, so. and it's you're not like completely changing your job no and for all i mean it's possible i might be working the exact same job but i doubt it sure but uh, i'll be in the same department at least well yeah so it's just a location change you know yeah yeah but uh um and and also i think i think it made it into the last episode like i was saying i I didn't know how how big of an impact like how how long i was going to be on a different schedule but it turns out just for a couple weeks then i should be uh Back on our normal schedule and back uh, recording on our normal day. Okay. So yeah. say goodbye to the daylight. Okay. Yeah. Or it's just a short little, <laughs> short little uh, exposure to light. Yeah. Nothing, nothing too serious. Okay. <laughs> All right. So today we did our first drawing for the Chapel on the Cliffs adventure from Goblin Stone. Mm-hmm. And today's winner is Jason S. Ooh. I'm not sure if I should use last names. I, I guess until we get a lot of Jason S's. Right, yeah. I won't. So Jason S, you probably know who you are. You'll be getting an email pretty soon in the next few days right. with uh, information on how to redeem that. So um, all I ask is that you you read over the adventure. If you want to play it, play it. If you like it, or even if you don't like it, go to Goblin Stone's website and let them know. Get, you know, Give them a review. Tell them what you think of it so that they can... Try to make it better in the future or make other products better in the future. And uh yeah. So that was that was the first first giveaway. Woo-hoo! We will have we will have uh, no, a winner every episode, as long as we keep getting people that uh that uh want to be entered. So right. if you want to enter, just send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com with chapel on the cliffs in the subject line. That's it. That's all you gotta do. Yep, that's all you gotta do, and then we'll we'll do a random selection and yep. see if you see if you win. Cool. So yeah, congratulations to, uh, congratulations to Jason S. Yes. All right, you want to go ahead and get into the episode? Sure. Okay. I want you to imagine that you are walking along through the woods mm-hmm. and you are starving. Oh gosh. Because mm. you uh you were in a car accident. Jeff. Oh no. You were in a car accident, you were driving through the countryside, something went wrong and uh, you woke up in your crashed car out and you have no idea where you are. Oh, gosh. You might even have memory loss, possibly a concussion. Who knows? Mm. It's some serious business here. Yeah. And you don't know how long you've been out here. You found some a source of water, but you don't have any food and you are really, really hungry. Yeah. And and so you're walking along and you, you smell baking bread, possibly. Okay. All right. Uh, so you, uh, what, what do you want to do? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to. Try to find the source of that smell. I don't, I, I, because according to follow my nose, as right. the toucan would say. Yes. You, uh, um, you sort of, you float along through the air following <laughs> the wafting, uh, aroma. Like the aroma, like grows fingers and like beckons, <laughs> yes. beckons me and like grabs my nostrils and pulls me along. There you go. Uh, and you, so you follow this, this aroma. Give me, um, make a, a survival check. A smell to see check. how well you're able to, to follow this. 
I got a, I got a, got a nice even ten there. Okay, okay. Well, um, I picture you as ha- having a high survival. Sure. Uh, so after a little while of following this aroma, you come to a very large house, mm. and you see smoke coming out of the chimney, and that's where the smell is coming from. Wait, is this house made out of like gingerbread or candy or anything? Make a perception check. All right. Nope, looks like a perfectly normal house. That's a regular old house. Regular old house. Yeah, but it's got, yeah, let's, let's, it, let's maybe, go there. Maybe it looks like it's decorated to look like it's made out of food. Oh. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a house. Wait, I, I'm, you know what? I'm just hungry. Yep. I, I'm, I exactly. Just, it looks like food. You know, like in the <laughs> cartoons when they're trapped on an island or something. And, and they the look, person turns into, the other person turns into a turkey. Or like the other, and then the other one like, turns into a fudge sundae or something <laughs> yes. like that. Uh, so you go over and you... You open the door mm-hmm. and you get a little bit of uh, chocolate. No, it can't be chocolate on, on your hand. You <laughs> it's wipe just it off. mud or something. Yeah, yeah, it's mud. Um, and you step inside and there is, uh, with that same perception check, you see a kindly old woman oh. sitting in front of uh, in front of an oven. And that's where the smell is coming from. It smells oh. like bread. Delicious. And you see this, this woman clearly is very, very good at baking because she's got all sorts of loaves of bread that they look like they've been sculpted to look like children. <laughs> Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> um, and so she's a little surprised that you that you uh, showed up at her door. Yeah, and, but then I, and then I just walked in. <laughs> you just walked in. Yeah. I am hungry. It's fine. Um, and she she says, oh, well, well, welcome, Sonny. Would you like some delicious food? I was like, yes, I'm, I've... <laughs> You've already started taking a bite out of some right. some child's right. head. Right. I'm going to car accident. Um... And um, yeah, I got in a car accident, and then I got really hungry. While you're eating, you notice that uh, the far side of the room is very, very shiny. Oh, uh, you notice that there's a very large pile of you. You're putting it together now. You realize she has a giant pile of those uh, foil wrapped chocolate <laughs> coins. So uh-huh. she's got like a whole bunch of these little, little yeah chocolate coins over in the corner, and uh, and. And you start to think to yourself, oh, man, that's almost like a, like a horde of some sort. <laughs> and then you you turn around and you notice that this kindly old woman is about 30 feet tall. <laughs> and when when she spoke with that high-pitched voice, uh, it was actually more like, welcome to my dungeon. <laughs> and then you realize that that's not a pile of chocolate coins. That is... The Dragon's Horde. Oh, man. It must have hit my head really hard in that accident. Uh, and, and you wake up. Whoa. And you, you're back in the car. Oh, okay. You're okay. Oh, wait. I'm, I'm still driving. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Dang it. I fell asleep at the wheel. <laughs> but as you're driving, you notice that you've got, you've got a chocolate coin in your hand. And it's starting to melt. Where did this come from, Jeff? <laughs> and then the GPS, and then the GPS chimes up. Turn right at Dragon's Horde. There you go. There you go. <laughs> God, that's a good idea for a, an intro. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> that right. that was not where I was going to be taking that at first, but then I realized that what I was going to do had nothing to do with a dragon or a horde. <laughs> I was going to be like, oh, you find a bug and then you eat it, but then I was like, where's the dragon and where's the horde? Oh man. Anyway. So our item for today is an RPG superstar item, as I've, uh, you know, many times I've brought in uh, RPG superstar items from Mm -hmm. Paizo.com. Yeah. Uh, This item was created by Mike Speck. Uh, It it was not a winner, but it was in the top 32, I guess. Anyway, so the item is called Blight Lady's Bread. This item is a desiccated insect corpse that when worn as an amulet Ooh. allows the bearer to use insect plague twice per day with a command word, which is a spell. Is it a fifth edition spell? Whatever the case, it was definitely a Pathfinder spell. Um, and then if you don't know the command word, you can make a, a nature or arcana check to uh, to learn it. Anyway, it also grants a bonus to fortitude saves or constitution saves versus poison. Mm. The bearer, in addition to being able to cast insect plague twice per day, the bearer may also choose to swallow the insect as a move action. Mm. If the if the swallower fails a fortitude save, which they may fail willingly, they die instantly, 
1d3 rounds later, their body explodes into a Creeping Doom spell. Ugh. In addition to the normal effects of Creeping Doom, each swarm eats all vegetation in its square if left undisturbed for two rounds. Oh my. These items are a specialty of the sociocidal druid called the Blight Lady and are often held by her most fanatical lieutenants as a last ditch defense against capture or as a suicide strike against a particularly hated target. Yikes. So yeah, it's an amulet that lets you cast a, you know, relatively powerful spell that summons insects a couple mm. times per day. Yeah. But its main thing is that kamikaze attack. Right. Yeah, that's you, pretty... You eat it, and then you explode into a Creeping Doom. I don't recall what Creeping Doom did in Pathfinder, but in, in third edition, mm. it did 1,000 damage. What? It You created a very slow-moving swarm of insects, of 1,000 insects each of which would crawl onto the target after however, like, because they move really slowly. And then each one dealt one point of damage. However, if the target had any damage reduction whatsoever, each one only did a point of damage, so it would do nothing. Oh. Isn't that crazy? But yeah, it's just, whoa, yikes. Yeah, I mean, it was it was like an eighth or ninth level spell, and it was, you pretty much could only use it against a target that was either immobile or very, very slow moving or mm. whatever. But, uh it's, yeah, yeah. And it's 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 been toned down since then. I think now you just like summon a whole bunch of insect swarms or whatever. Sure, sure. But, but uh, yeah, but that's that's uh, that's that's pretty intense. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I thought I thought the idea of um, you know of a a sociocidal druid mm -hmm. was kind of cool. Yeah, I like the idea of having her followers like use this kamikaze attack against a particularly hated target. Yeah. Yeah, that's I, I've I've had I've had an interest with like I remember there was a like the blighter prestige class or something. Yeah, I think it was in complete. Or it might have just been in Masters of the Wild or something. It might have been an older one. It might have been. It was it was in one of the older uh, yeah third edition books. But yeah, it's just a it, it, it's just a, it's a druid, but you take more like things that are like more destructive, more destructive towards nature rather than helpful. Yeah, there was a a while ago. I remember seeing a. A druid write-up that somebody made where the it was a dwarven druid where their entire thing, their entire like shtick, shtick was survival of the fittest. Mm. And so they would destroy basically it was a druid that would purposely destroy all things natural in the hopes that the the things that survived would be strong enough to then mm. create stronger offspring and so on. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So yeah, kind of kind of a, a neat take on on what a druid is like. It's like you know if hey nature doesn't need our help, right? That's yeah, that's you know so so like nature doesn't need to be defended. What we should be doing is we should be killing off the things in nature that are not strong enough to succeed. Yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah. Druids are cool. Yeah, I I mean I I'll never play one because I don't <laughs> like I just I don't the idea of playing a a druid or a ranger just does not interest me <laughs> at all. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's cool stuff that can be done with them. Yeah, for sure. We I mean, get like the shape changing and stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of cool. In my um, every every few weeks, I've been playing a uh, game of D and D with some friends from work, and one of them is a druid, and um, he's pretty new to the game, so he doesn't really do a lot. But uh, what he does, he basically just turns into a bear all the time. That's his whole. Well, I mean, his his character's shtick is I turn into a bear. Well, if you know, if you could turn into a bear, why yeah. wouldn't you just why why not try to use that to solve all of your problems? <laughs> right. When uh, when all you have is a bear, everything looks like a fish. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> nice tasty salmon. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that'll do it for the Dragon's Horde today. Okay. Um, if anybody wanted to submit magic items for the Dragon's Horde or questions for us to discuss or stories for the funeral pyre, how would they do so? And they can send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. There you go. I also want to remind everybody to check out our Patreon. Mm -hmm. You can find us at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. We've got some outtakes up there. I have some fiction that I wrote for this month mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of February. So like not too long after this episode comes out, uh, we're going to be um, sometime around there. We're going to be doing a, a game of D&D &D over Roll20. Uh -huh. So that should be fun. Um, so if anybody wants to check out our, our Patreon, go check it out. See if any of the uh, rewards look good to you. And if so, toss us a buck, a buck a month, five bucks a month or ten bucks a month. And uh have some fun. Yeah. Yeah, we greatly we greatly appreciate it. Yes. And then uh, also let me tell everybody check out CritAcademy.com. Mm -hmm. Great guys over there. D&D Character Lab as well. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm blanking on everything that I wanted to say here. 
Um, you want to talk about that, like the giveaway thing or? Yeah, I'll, I think I'll just leave it right here and then we'll put in that part later. Okay. Cause yeah. Um, okay. You want to get into some questions? Yeah, sure. Let's cool. get going. Our first question comes from L tab and this was on N world. Do you have any advice on how players can set up ambushes? Yeah. So, so yeah, this one's a weird one just cause like players are usually on players are offensive. usually on, on the offensive. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how many times I've been in a game where there was an opportunity to set up an ambush. Right. Yeah. There. Yeah. Like when you think of an ambush, you think of it like, you know, you're like walking down the road and then like a bunch of bandits come out and ambush you. Yeah. And I mean, players aren't usually the ones that are waiting on the side of the road. I mean, maybe sometimes I guess it's, it's entirely dependent on your DM, whether the DM ever puts you in a situation where you can. I remember that one, there, there was that one time we were like trying to get ambushed or something like that. I can't, or was that, was that the case? I can't Are you remember. talking about the time where you used the alchemy jug to make it look like you were peeing? <laughs> Which we'd used that a couple times. Yes. Uh, yeah. In, in that case, that was, you were explicitly like, Hey, um, you were told, Hey, you guys need to go and ambush this, uh, supply cart. Cause you were like working with the bad guys for a little bit. Oh. Or you, tra- you were trying to get in with the bad guys. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, like that, that was a specific situation where you, the players were setting up an ambush. Yeah. And, uh, it, I don't know. It's, it's, it's tricky because a lot of the, a lot of the tactics that you would use to set up an ambush probably take time require, you know, a lot, they probably take like, uh, information that a lot of players yeah. aren't going to have. Right. You're going to, you got to know when, like, if a player is going to be ambushing somebody, it's more than likely going to be ambushing a specific person or yeah. like target. And so like knowing exactly where they're going to be and being able to set up for it and that sort of thing, it's kind of tricky. It, I mean, it's going to evolve, it involve a lot of like uh, skill checks and stuff like that, which, you know, when a player wants to do something very specific, they have to roll a bunch of dice and it's yeah. more than likely they're going to fail. When an NPC <laughs> wants to do that, the, the DM just goes, okay, you're being, you're being ambushed. Right. You know, right. So like it's so it's not as it's not as easy now like that's more like long term ambushes I'm thinking like I think it, it's more possible for players that like if they're in a dungeon and they know there's a monster or whatever or some goblins in the next room mm-hmm. they could like go down the hall and basically set up a trap sort of thing or, like, I guess set up yeah. an ambush that way where they like lure them into a different room and then ambush them there yeah but you know that's that 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 involves a little bit less a little bit less work i guess or a little less less, less like you know um preparation right right um yeah i mean i i guess you can you could try to lure someone in with something that you know they like i remember in 4th edition there was a a really cool wizard ability that you you would it was like a daily attack you would cast the spell and you would create an illusory object that anyone who looked at it would see something that they really wanted. Mm. And so mechanically you would it would cause you to you would pull creatures towards this square that you designated. Sure. And so cuz fourth edition was all about like tactical movement and so on. Yeah. And so you would you would pull creatures towards it and then I think like they had to make a or something you like made an attack against them and if you succeeded they couldn't move away, I think. Huh. But that kind of an idea could work if you're in a dungeon with a bunch of goblins or something and you know the goblins are uh really greedy you could toss like a big pile of gold over around you know like at the edge of a of a of a room right yeah and then the goblins will see it and then oh they want they run inside then you you know bonk them over the head or whatever <laughs> yeah um you could always use the old standby which is propping up a bucket of water <laughs> on top of a door uh-huh yeah <laughs> and then uh uh <laughs> or or if you're trying to uh, ambush James Woods, you could uh, leave a trail, <laughs> leave of, a trail of candy or a trail of, quote unquote, gold coins. Sure. <laughs> um, but but yeah, so so, you know, advice on how the players can set up ambushes is really going to depend on yeah. the DM and, and the type of game that they're running. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. If they're like, again, if they're doing like a specific target or something like that, you got to, you'll want to do like a series of like investigations or something like that yeah. to find out, find out who the person is, you know, what their schedule is, like yeah. where they're going, you know, if like, 
you know, like what they're wearing, that sort of thing. So you can like identify them or something like that. So right. maybe some stealth checks so that they don't notice you while you're invest- tailing them for a day or whatever. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, you know, you can bribe somebody to like, uh, I don't know, lure them somewhere sure. or something like sure. that. Hey kid, put this trail of candy <laughs> yeah. into this box. The kid just eats the candy. Yeah. <laughs> you, Aha, you, the, the kid was actually the the mark in the first place. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you give the kid some money and some candy and he just takes both of them, eats the candy and leaves. What if what if he eats the money <laughs> and then tries to spend the candy? <laughs> it's like it's those dang chocolate coins like yep. it's so confusing i don't know it's like i forgot which one was which and i just ate them both right <laughs> now i i do very much recommend any dms out there try and put your players in situations where they are on the defensive sure how cool of a change would it be if instead of the players going into the bad guy's stronghold to kill him or whatever what if instead they knew that they found out that the bad guys were coming to attack their stronghold. Like the bad guys were coming mm. to attack the players in their hideout. Yeah. I think that that we've, you know, we talked about like having a, um, an, uh, an encounter where you're like doing some sort of a ritual or something. Oh yeah. And then the enemies are coming in to try and stop you. Like, I think that could work really well. And then that could give players an opportunity to do something they don't normally do, which is set up traps, mm. set up ambushes. And so I think that's a really cool thing that a lot of DMs don't do. So if you're listening to this as and you're a DM, try and think of a way to put your players in that kind of a situation. Yeah, yeah. That makes me think of something. Um, I forget the adventure. I forget which campaign it was, but I remember us fighting on a bridge or something. Uh, this must have been an Eberron thing, maybe. It does sound like something. No, wait, no, no. I was playing a, I think I was playing a druid at the time. Was that? Um, was it Red Hand of Doom? It might have been Red Hand of Doom. Okay. It might have been Red of Him and Doom. I'm not sure. Well, what was what was the adventure where I was playing? I was playing two characters. I was yeah, playing. that's Red Hand of Doom. Yeah, Red Hand of Doom. But it wasn't an ambush. It was like a. But it was players being on the defensive. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we we had to like stop an army or something from crossing a bridge, okay. maybe. And then I think one of the things I did was like tried to use, uh, like, try to use like a like a move earth spell or something like that mm-hmm. uh to like to like basically break the bridge so that nobody can get across it or something like that okay i think that was right hand of doom because the whole point of that adventure is that there's an army that is marching on this city or whatever in x number of days right and so a lot of the adventures are like you have to go and you have to cut off this resource that they're using mm. or you have to cut off this in that case i'm pretty sure it was they're going to cross this bridge and if you can destroy the bridge or make it so they can't cross the bridge, then they'll have to go around the long way. Yeah, it'll like it, yeah, it'll give you more time or whatever. So I mean, like, I mean that could be an interesting like a little ambush thing. Like you like you lure you know you lure things under a bridge and then destroy the bridge and then you know they fall they fall down or whatever. Yeah, but like defensive stuff like that where you're like you're where like you're setting up the where you're setting up the defenses of the encounter mm-hmm. ahead of time. Um, it's it's like there there are like basically it's 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 difficult because it's it's not always as black and white as like oh you killed them and you're done it like it depends on what your goal is there because like with the bridge thing i remember i don't know like if the enemy like because we were like fighting somebody or something it was like a scouting party maybe that was coming or maybe like the army maybe the army was there and we were just like stopping them from getting across and then so they had to get across yeah, go maybe, around maybe I can't quite remember, but I just like when you have an encounter like that where like the the fail state isn't your characters die, it's the enemies like you know, get past this point or whatever. Yeah, those are kind of hard because like when you know when it, when an enemy moves in their turn and you can't do anything because it's not your turn, right? Then, because, because of how D and D's combat works, right? Yeah, the way the D and D's uh, combat work. I, uh, there's a there's a similar issue in. Um, Oh, this is sort of going off, uh, going off question, but th- there's a similar issue in the uh, in Warhammer, mm-hmm. where like, uh, you have like so many units, uh, so it's like so many groups of guys, and when it's your turn, you move all of them, okay, and then you shoot with all of them, and then you charge with all of them, and then you attack with all of them, and like, and like, then that's your turn. So like, your turn could take a good amount of time. 
because you have to move every single unit and do the roll for everyone in there. And then like, you know, so like if you went first, you could potentially like take out a good chunk of the other person's army before they even got to do a single thing. Yeah. So it's like all they got to do was set up where their guys are. Uh, you know, and like some people play with the house rules, like, okay, you alternate, like you like, I move one unit, shoot with it. And then, and then you move a unit and shoot with it. And so mm-hmm. like that, but it's like, but some of the things in the game aren't really set up for that because like a lot of them are like, you have to be within a certain range of guys to get certain buffs. So like sure, if you're moving sure. them separately, they're not always going to have that buff. Yeah. Um, but that's, that get off track, but, um, but it, it, <laughs> It's, you know, setting an ambush is definitely complicated because it's like when you're putting when you're putting the setup of the encounter in the player's hands, Mm -hmm. this is several people trying to work together to come up with a single plan, whereas the dungeon master just has the plan and does it. Yeah. So, like, you know, it, you know, it you you want your players to be able to work together well, but it's not always going to be you know super easy it's not gonna yeah. be an easy thing i just don't ever see an ambush being something that the players are just like oh hey let's do this i feel like anytime there's going to be an ambush it's because it's like th- that is what the adventure like that is what right, this yeah. encounter is going to be is the players have are, are supposed to go in and set up an ambush yeah it's like the idea of one of the npcs like hey like this they're you know the npc comes to the players with the information these guys are going to be here at this time you should ambush them right you know yeah, because I mean, I mean, I suppose it's it's quite possible that uh, somebody could be running a game that is just so open world or whatever that the players are able to find out that kind of information on their own. Uh-huh. I guess, but it just I, it doesn't strike me as something that's very common in a game yeah. like D anD. There's just so much prep work involved, even for the not just for the players but for the DM too. And it's like it's it's one of those things that when like like a, one player will suggest it, mm-hmm. and then like. It's it like it sounds like a cool idea, but then like you can like it's like the DM is always just like, oh, like, <laughs> it's like it's like okay, it's like yes, it's a great idea, but there's so much work involved in that. Okay, you have to roll this and this and this. And yeah. Okay, where do you guys want to set it up? Okay, here. All right. Kind of a similar situation when um one of the when I think during during the uh, Ichi campaign. <laughs> Uh, there was a session that I was I was running, so I wasn't playing as Ichi. He was off doing something else. But I was I was running an adventure. It was a uh, it was a published Wizards of the Coast third edition adventure called Lord of the Iron Fortress. Hmm. And I was running this adventure, and the the players that I had, they were also you know is like Chris Chris Sound Ding <laughs> was in there. Also, this guy John that I talked about, Melissa, who was a killer DM when she was a DM. Mm-hmm. And so, so I I had these players that were really really good at what they at. at coming up with clever stuff because they'd been playing the game for a long time. They'd played in a lot of groups, whatever. And one of them had the idea to essentially cause one of the side quests involved these dragons. And one of the players had an idea to to trick the dragons into thinking that the bad guy in the tower they were supposed to be infiltrating had stolen from them. Basically, the players used like, I don't know, etherealness or something to like to go in and steal all the dra- the dragon's hoard. They stole it. <laughs> and then um, they left a, something that belonged to the bad guy that they had found earlier in the adventure. And so then the dragons found the thing. They were like, oh my goodness, this guy stole from us. Rah! Then the dragons attacked the bad guy's tower instead. Uh-huh. And I was a very, very new DM, a very inflexible DM at the time who I was learning. You know, I was, I was trying not to be so inflexible. So... But, but I didn't know what to do. So I kind of had to tell everybody, okay, guys, I don't know what is going to happen in this case. Right, yeah. You're all experienced DMs. Can one of you guys maybe give me some tips on how to adjudicate these dragons attacking right. this thing? And then uh, I think Chris probably was the one that uh, that did it. But, um, you know, he just looked at a little bit of the dungeon, was like, okay, uh, this room is is now destroyed. This room is now destroyed. These NPCs are dead. These NPCs are hiding in this other room. And then, uh, you know, and, and then we went from there. But that was something where it was the player's idea. But as the DM, I wasn't prepared for it. Right. So I did kind of have to be like, okay, I need some time to come up with what this yeah. means. Yeah. Um, that's that's one of those things that, like, when it happens, you hope it's near the end of your session anyway. <laughs> you know, right. It's like, well, it's like, well, I guess, I guess I'm okay if that last encounter isn't super climactic. All right, yeah, he uh, the bad guy dies. Yeah, you right, win. Yeah, or or it's just like you know, like they they send the the dragons to attack, 
at the end of the session so that you can be like, okay, well, oh, we'll, I see what you're saying. We'll yes. come, we'll come back next session and I'll have something ready for it. Whereas like, if that's like at the beginning of the session or like, or like, like sort of in the middle, or you still have like an hour or something, <laughs> yeah. and you're going to be like, well, uh, uh, let's, let's do, let's go shopping first or something. I don't know. It's like, you get, you get a random encounter on the road to, to the back on the road to the tower or whatever. Yeah. Wasn't that, um, didn't, didn't you, didn't you talk about that when we were talking about like, uh, whether or not a party should get experience for something that they don't necessarily kill directly? That's a good, I don't know if I did bring it up on that episode, but that would have made a great I, I, like yeah, I think a great thing to bring up for that. Maybe we did. That. Well, there was definitely like the example of somebody like rammed an airship. Well, into yeah, something. yeah, that was that was the example that started. That was yeah, somebody rammed an airship, and they and then this this person on Facebook was saying that they wouldn't give experience in that case. I I don't know what I did at the time, but looking back, I would give experience, not necessarily. I wouldn't necessarily give the experience as if they had defeated the dragons. Right. They didn't defeat the dragons. The dragons are still there. Right. But they did steal from the dragons. Uh huh. And they did overcome a bunch of the dungeon with a clever idea rather yeah. than combat. So I, I don't know if I would give them the same amount of experience. Right, yeah. But I would definitely give them experience for both separate things. Right. You wouldn't exactly, like, you know, pool together all of the experience for all the monsters involved. Right. And then give them that. You would you would, you'd make up something similar. but I, I would definitely take into account what resources, if any, they spent. Mm -hmm. You know, going back to... The airship example, like if someone's willing to give up an airship to overcome a challenge, I'll let them do it. I'll probably give them experience for it because that's a huge resource they're giving up. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah. I mean, like, you know, and like the resources involved in setting up an ambush when, you know, when it could just be as easy as like just attacking them you yeah. know, head on. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's that's actually an interesting question. Would you give Would you give more experience for for players for like setting up a successful ambush? I don't think I would give more experience mm -hmm. because like they're they're overcoming the same challenge. Yes, it's clever, but I think part of part of the reward is the fact that they didn't have to spend any resource. They don't necessarily have to like spend any resources to do it. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's that's true. Because you'd have to like. If you did a successful ambush, you potentially are spending less resources because you're not maybe not taking as much damage because you got like if, the surprise round. If it's likely that somebody might have died had they attacked head on. Right. Then the fact that nobody died from the ambush sure. is, is part of the reward. I would I, I would never consider that the entire reward. Right. I would still give them at least as much experience uh, as they would if they if they did fight and win. Right. If they did it in like a in an impressive way, I might give them the like um inspiration or there something you like that or then. or maybe experience and then some sort of non experience reward as well mm. um so maybe like oh you you get the experience and you won the fight and also one of the guys one of the bad guys is now on your side or something sure um or like some member of a guild or something witnessed it and was impressed and I don't know. You or have or some your sort of influence. Or yeah, or just your characters are now famous because they stopped the they, they ambushed the group of bandits. Or right. Something. Yeah, yeah. It's like they ambushed the ambushers. Yeah. So yeah, I guess it's just it's it's, <laughs> it's tricky because so few campaigns so so few adventures usually put the players in a situation where they can ambush. The players right. are almost always on the offensive. And so it's it's just it's not a usual it's not a common thing as far as how to actually set up an ambush, yeah. you know, make skill checks, right, try yeah. to set up traps, put a bucket of water on top of a door, whatever whatever you <laughs> got to do. Just a doorway in the middle of the road with a bucket on top of it and so it right, just goes right. and opens it. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, keep in mind like what needs what the players need to, you know, what the characters, what the PCs need to know. Mhm. Mm in order to execute the ambush. Right. So like they got to know where, where, the, where, where they're going to do it, where they're going to, where the target's going to be, what the target has, that sort of thing. So, so keep that in mind, you know, have them roll the appropriate checks to learn those things, you know, and then maybe roll the appropriate checks to like set up traps and whatnot, or, sure. you know, you know, spot checks and hide checks and that sort of thing. Yeah. Listen to me, hide checks, stealth checks, stealth checks, right? Yeah. Hide and move silently checks. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. It's like, do you remember when that? And then spot and listen were two different skills yeah, too. Spot and listen, hide and move silently. It's crazy. Yeah. Because well, well, innuendo was its own skill. Innuendo, right? If I had glasses, I'd take them off and I would <laughs> do, do the thing. Do the Steve thing. Used to do. Uh, what is it now? It's just insight or something, right? Like, or, uh, or ye- deception? I think so. I think it's deception and opposed by their insight or something. Yeah. yeah. Our next question comes from R. Polly, and this is on Reddit. R. Polly 13. R. Polly 13. Do you ever find it hard to catch a player up that joins late into a campaign? Also, any suggestions on merging the new character into the party? So somebody who shows yeah. up late or, or like shows up late to the, the the campaign. So like, yeah, just somebody who joins a few sessions, sessions in, in or maybe uh, several sessions in. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tricky because, you know, generally speaking, you think that like, like a, an adventuring party has, you know, a, a significant level of trust. They are putting right. their lives in each other's hands. And so it's, it is always strange thinking that you're going to add somebody in late into the campaign because then it's like well this is this is an outsider why should anybody trust them and so on right yeah it's it's in a, in a campaign you're you know you're a group of adventurers and basically everyone you've ever encountered either wants to kill you or wants you to kill someone yeah you know it's so it's like okay so this random person shows up and wants to join your party it's like obviously this guy is like a double agent right Duh. right um and and so uh that can that can be a bit of an obstacle i do want to point out though that like Generally speaking, when an adventure, when a campaign starts and everybody starts adventuring in the beginning, most of the time it's just, hey, we met in a tavern, let's go adventuring. Right. So like, may- maybe you're putting a bit too much thought into it. Well, right, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's this is definitely something that groups are, are going to encounter. Mm. Um, catching up the player. So the first part, catching up a player can be tricky because maybe the the group that's already there has like developed some tactics or whatever that they might, uh, you know, like, oh, the fighter always, or the, the wizard always shoots fireball and then the fighter delays his action to go in afterwards. So the, you know, the wizard doesn't blow him up or something. Right, yeah. Um, and when you get a new player in that doesn't know about these tactics or doesn't, isn't necessarily thinking about these tactics, it can make things a little difficult. I mentioned that uh, Lord of the Iron Fortress thing. We had a new player that day that had never played with us. He was just like a friend of, one of the one of the other people in the group, he had never played with us, and he never played with us again after that day. Oh no! But I remember when the dragons were attacking. I was just kind of narrating, like, okay, you know, dragons they knock down the front door of this fortress, they go away, and you hear all sorts of noise. And that player felt like he should be doing something rather than just sitting there listening to what happens. And so the player decided, oh, okay, yeah, my character is going to try to sneak in past the dragons. While the dragons are attacking. Meanwhile, the other players are just like, you know, giving him a weird look. Like, they're just sitting back and letting it happen. Right, yeah. And then this player insisted on going inside the building. And then as a result, the dragons killed him too. Because he was in the building. They didn't really care who or what right, was yeah. in there. They were just killing everything. And I think uh, one of the other... I think John, the, I think it might he might have been his friend that was there. I think he sort of suggested that we retcon him going in and say that he didn't go in uh-huh. because it was kind of a dumb move and he was probably just doing it because, you know, he's new to the group. He feels like he should be doing something right, yeah. to, you know, involve himself. And I, I'm not faulting him for that. No. Um, but that that is, you know, that's something that can happen when you have a new player. They might not be thinking as as uh consistently as they should right because yeah. they're new they feel like they should just be doing something yeah it's like any anytime like anytime you start a new group or you're you're, you're you know you're trying to figure out if you're a fit for those people so like yeah. when you're when you're going into an already established group it's even more difficult because you know you you can't you can't just be like you can't it's hard it's hard to find your space um, when, when if, if everybody else knows each other right, yeah. and you're the new person, not only to the adventuring party, but also to the group of friends, mm-hmm. that can definitely be something that like, it's, it's an obstacle. I know I've, I've joined groups that they've all been friends for a long time and I'm the new guy. And like, it's hard to, it's hard to engage with anybody as, as comfortably as I should. Like I'm, I'm not going to be as, uh, as open as if. You know, these were all my friends. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And like, yeah, like even if everybody knows each other and they've all played D&D before and it just it just happened to be that like the the player couldn't 
come for the first couple sessions or sure. something like that. It's usually not too hard to adjust to. Um, they the DM might even go as far as to say as the character was there already or a sort of thing. Or well, like that was one thing I was going to say. Yeah. Um, I do have some tips on involving the character into the campaign. Right. Um, so so it's like if you know the person's going to be there later or something like that, you can you can make preparations for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll get to that in just a moment. So so with um, with a player, as far as like catching up. The player, if they're trying to like, if you're trying to catch them up on the story or whatever so oh. far, I would encourage all DMs to only only catch them up on things that their character would know about and then have the other players explain it to catch them up in game. Yeah. I think that's a really cool idea. If this if this character doesn't know about this evil plot by the necromancer, but they know about that group of orcs that attacked the town uh-huh. that they didn't know it was sent by this necromancer, but then the other players can uh, can fill them in. Right, They'll be like, oh, you know that group of orcs that attacked the town? Yeah, this guy's the guy responsible. And then it's it's a bit it'll be a bit more natural getting them, you know, getting them involved. Yeah, yeah. If you can have the if you the, the, get the players caught up in game and in in character, it can actually be kind of interesting. So yeah. it's like, yeah, they cut co- they come in and like, you know, they burst down a door and and like. They come across like the necromancer, and the necromancer is like, "Like darn you, not you guys again!" And then like the new guy would be like, "I don't even know this guy. Who is this guy? Exactly. Like, exactly. What's going on? I don't understand." It's like th- this is the guy we were telling you telling you about. Oh, <laughs> that's the one with the skeletons. Okay, right, right. Um, and heck, you could even use the fact that this character was not part of the group as a way to throw the enemies off. Sure, yeah. Because if the enemies know, okay, it's this group of it's a it's a half orc, it's an elf, and a dwarf. And they've been giving us all this trouble. And then a halfling shows up. Right. And then, like, if they see a halfling, they're not going to be like, oh, he's part of that group. They're going to be like, oh, who's this guy? Right. Yeah, and yeah. then you can send him in and, like, try to, like, trick the, the enemy into doing something. Exactly. Or setting up an ambush. Oh, there you go. That's how you That's how you set up an ambush. You have to, have, <laughs> you have to bring someone new into the party. Yes. There it is. Now, as far as getting the character, as, as far as including the character into a group, one thing that, that I have been in a campaign that does... Uh, back when I was in the fourth edition campaign that uh, led to my character Artemis Red Sleeves, um, who, if you uh, subscribe to our Patreon, that uh, that's um, the first month of fiction is about him, oh, about okay. him learning to learning to fight as a defender. Ooh. Anyway, um, in that campaign, the premise that the DM set up was that each of us are part of like a group of knights that have been exiled or whatever. So we were like out in the wilderness, just living by ourselves. Mm. And he said that there are more than the five of you or whatever, however many of us there were. He said that there are actually like 12 or 13 of you all together, but you split up at one point. And so the campaign is following these four or five people. And then once we got like a new home base, story-wise, the rest of our party members showed up, but... We never fleshed them out. The reason being, if one of us died and we needed an excuse for a new character to also be on the same side and also be fighting for the same cause. Right. And be pretty much caught up to speed. It, exactly. Then your character is just one of those other knights mm. that just hasn't been involved in the story so far. Sure. They've been off having their own adventures. That's why they're also leveled up to whatever level you guys are. But you've already got an in when it comes to involving that new character because the characters already know each other. Mm. Um, I've tried doing things like that with my own games. Not everybody goes along with that. Like if I've still had players be like, Oh, okay. Yeah. My new character, he just, he, he just shows up. He's like, Oh, I want to be a part of your big team as well. It's like, okay, well, I mean, that's kind of why I set that up, but whatever. Right. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. That's, that's definitely good if if it, that's good that's a good idea for adventures where you know like it's a, it's a big possibility that the characters will die cuz like you know the the way we usually play it it's not the like we usually try to avoid that as much as possible because yeah. of like, all the extra work that goes into creating characters and when you get to att- attach to a character and stuff like that so right like, right but if like you know if you're one of those DMs that like it takes pride in killing off players, but yeah. you don't necessarily want the game to end. And the players are also into that sort of thing. You know, yeah, like having like a basically a 
pool of care, you know, like a pool of characters, not you know necessarily stat statted characters, but like sure. you know characters that fit within the story, having you know having some to pull from. Mm-hmm. So you know, like you, yeah, it could, it could be that your your you know uh, original uh, the original group of characters were like training up some. Uh, troops or something like that and then like you know when one of the characters dies one of those troop guys like gets promoted and sure, he's like oh sure. hey I'm part of the party now um, I want to I'll here's a suggestion I'll make I'll encourage people to I mean maybe this wouldn't necessarily work if you have um, if you're bringing in a new player that is not previously part of the group but like let's say you do have a character that's in the group and then that character dies and then that player just makes a new character maybe if you're that that player Try to try to use an NPC that was previously introduced into the campaign, uh-huh. and then work with the DM to make that NPC into your new character. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know how how many people would want to do that. Right. Yeah. Everybody wants their character to be their own. Yeah. But, but I mean, like, let's say there's just been that that guy that you've you've met on a few occasions, and uh, you know your character has talked to him a couple times. If he isn't very fleshed out story wise, maybe you you can then take that. And run with it, uh-huh. assuming the DM doesn't already have plans for them or whatever. <laughs> we had the like the one like uh, like town guard guy that we called Sleepy Gary. <laughs> Sleepy Gary. After the guy from uh, Rick and Morty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, <laughs> if one of you guys died, maybe one of you could come back as, uh, as Sleepy, Sleepy Gary. Gary. <laughs> it like turns out he's like a you know he's like a fifth level fighter or something. Yeah. Oh wait, no, no, we're in favor, and so uh, he's actually a thirtieth level. Uh, fighter wizard cleric it's paladin like Elminster's cousin. <laughs> yes, Elminster. <laughs> I was gonna. I was. I was actually thinking along the same lines. Like, oh, uh, M Minster. Right. Yeah. Like, but that's his brother. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> um. Yeah. So, like, I mean, that's that's one possible way to involve a player. You know, catch a a character up into the campaign. Um. Really, I've been I've been in groups where there's there's been new characters or new players or whatever, mm-hmm. and it's always awkward. No matter what, it's always like, okay, so you guys are going through the woods, ooh, and you see someone following you, and then we all know that it's the other player's character, but our characters aren't. If someone is following them in the woods, right? They're not just gonna be like, oh, hey, come adventure with us. They're gonna like think it's. Like a, a random encounter, like all of these other random encounters. Right, you're gonna fight. get the guy who's like, I tag it. Exactly. He's like, you do, you do. He, even though, even though, like you know, meta gaming, we know it's not any danger, but you're gonna just attack it. Yeah, that's what my character would do. Yeah, and then, and then there's probably gonna be the uh, the new player is probably gonna want to be trying to prove themselves, so maybe they'll try to take on a member of the party and try to beat them up or whatever. Yeah. And you know, they're tr- they're trying to like out dark out loner out mysterious <laughs> each other and uh, it's it's always awkward so like i've th- i think there might have even been times i've when i've been running a game that i've just been like oh, he's just he's just part of the group now yeah just, just just hand wave it yeah it's it's not gonna be the most immersive is well she <laughs> there is well she yes <laughs> um uh and so so it's not gonna be the most immersive thing ever but it means you can go on with the game instead of having to spend half of the session right. getting this new player's character to be a part of the group. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Unless, and you know, unless a situation falls into your lab where, you know, you can work it in easily. It sometimes it is just best to just kind of have it happen. It's right. just there. Cause yeah, I get, yeah, you're right. It's like, it's going to be better to just keep going yeah. than to have to struggle to find a way for this to work out. Yeah, similar to um, if you have, uh, if there's a player that is absent for one session, yeah, you could try to spend a bit of time to come up with a reason why they're not there, and mm-hmm. then come up with a reason why they join back up with you in the next next session, or you can just hand wave it. I generally tend to go with the the latter, just hand wave it because you know it 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 means you can just get on with the game. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you're in the middle of an adventure, I would rather just just go on with the adventure rather than spend all this time and, you know, deal with stuff that, mm. I don't know, isn't really integral to the plot. Yeah. So if the if the player is joining the game kind of like between plot points, 
Okay. You can definitely do that and then like maybe come up with something later. Sure. Because definitely. So if, so if there was a good, if there was a space of time between like where the players or what the characters were doing between sessions, mm-hmm. you could just say, oh, and like oh, this guy's with your party now. And then just come up with something that happened in that time later that explains where they came from. Yeah. And now if it happened like in the middle of a plot point, well, in that case, maybe, maybe if you know the player is going to be joining you. Say like, hey, why don't you join us this week? Well, like, why don't you join us after this plot point, and then we'll write you in, basically. Okay. But like, if that's not the case, and you're trying to write them in in like in the middle of a plot in media res, right? Yeah. So like, you you might in that case, you would probably have to come up with something. Yeah. Maybe is maybe it could be something as simple as like they're a prisoner in the dungeon that mm-hmm. you're that you're in the middle of. Right. And you you know, let them out and like there might be some mistrust or something there, but that could be kind of interesting. Yeah. Um so like but yeah, I guess I guess that's a good piece of advice is like if you're gonna bring in a new player, try to try to have them come in between plot points or between like it, between adventures rather than in the middle of one. You know? Yeah, yeah. So if possible, try and sort of engineer the adventure a little bit so that when a new player comes in, it's not it's not a huge issue. It's right. not something that's going to derail the yeah derail the campaign. So yeah, it's it's always tough. It's always a little. It's always gonna there's always gonna be a little bit of growing pains when you try to bring in a new a new character. Yeah, we've talked about like just. Like getting along with group with new groups and stuff like that. Yeah. Like it, that's a lot. That has a lot to do with it. It was just getting used to the players themselves and yeah. not not necessarily the characters. Um, you know, like you know, are they are they a good fit? That whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and like that, you know, are they a good fit? Can play with the with the with the character because like you know, if you if if you're a mostly a group of all like good aligned, you know, characters. Yeah. And then the new guy wants to play chaotic evil or something. <laughs> right, right. That could be a big problem. Could you know, be. You know, but you don't want to you don't want to tell a player that they can't play like, you know, because... or even that they can't play the character they want to play. Right, yeah. You might want to tell them they can't play the character they want to play if you don't if you don't think that the player they're going to play the character they're going to play is a a good fit, but right. you know. It's like it's like like why is this person playing? Why are they coming in late? Is this somebody like y'all? Like we only have three people. We we should we should get a fourth because we want a healer. Like don't bring sure, sure. don't bring that person in just to fill a class role or something like that. Right, right. I don't know. Um, yeah, no, it's yeah, it's difficult. Uh, it's it's it 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 just screams social awkwardness, which I have troubles with. It so. really does. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, like, you know, like th- those moments, those moments of like the guy goes into and, and tries to sneak into the tower where the, where the dragons are like attacking. And you just go like, why, why, why would you, why? you don't want to, you don't want to say anything, but you also don't want, you're like, I don't, why would you do that? Who would do that? Yeah. It's like why would why wouldn't you just let the dragons do the thing that you were going to do? Like But I mean, I can understand he he feels like he's got to be doing something. Right, yeah. Like I mean, you know. I don't know. Like I don't necess- I don't necessarily like blame him or anything like that. I just be like, how did that- I I just know I would feel incredibly awkward in yeah. that situation yeah. of like no don't no don't do that. <laughs> you know, but but it could be like, you know, like in my mind, it's like, OK, but then they could just be set in their ways and then we have an argument over it. It's like, I, I guess. Know, yeah. Just, OK, let's just let him do it and learn his lesson, I guess. I don't know. I guess. Kind of kind of related. I in after we finish recording today, I'm going to I probably should have mentioned this earlier. After we finish recording, I'm going to be guesting on a Farscape podcast. Farscape oh, yeah. is a sci fi uh, sci fi channel TV show from like the around the year 2000. Mm-hmm. And um I I was telling you before we start recording that like I'm I'm really nervous because uh, I want to be as prepared as possible because right. I, I want to be able to engage with the other hosts as much as as they do and hopefully as naturally as they do. But when coming into something like if, if whenever we have a guest on, I'm sure that the guests aren't don't involve themselves as much as they would if uh, on their own podcast. Sure, for sure. Example. So um, you know, it's it's uh, there's always a little bit of awkwardness when when getting involved with a new group for the first time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's just, just something you got to deal with. Try to, try to just be as prepared as possible and try to, to be as accommodating as possible. Yeah. I get, yeah. So, 
<laughs> coming into coming to into an established campaign is like being a guest on a podcast. <laughs> I suppose so. I suppose so. I probably should mention the name of that podcast. It's called The Frellcast. Okay, yeah. For anybody who's familiar with Farscape, they will understand why it is called, called that. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think I think we've done a satisfactory answer for this one. <laughs> um, it's it's tough, but you gotta just. Yeah, you got. I would say just hand wave it until until you become really right comfortable with doing stuff like that with integrating new people. Just hand wave it and say they were always there. Yeah, that's that's the easiest way to do it is to just make sure that they're coming in between adventures. Mm-hmm. Hand wave it and then come up with something later that sure, kind of sure. fits. You know, you know, maybe, maybe something will come up later on that like oh that makes sense we could have them you know be part of that. There group. you go. There you go. It's like or like you know you come across a, a group of NPCs and like. And, like, you could, like, be like, oh, yeah, we've been, you know, the NPCs that, like, a group of NPCs that's, like, sort of been in the background the whole time, but you never interact with directly until now. And, then like, it turns out that character knew them or something like that. Sure, you know, sure. Just kind of write them in that way. Yeah, so so don't worry about, worry more about making the game run smoothly and yeah. that the players are, make sure the players are having fun before you worry about the, like, logistics of getting the group together. Right, yeah. The, as long as you guys are playing the game. Yes. You'll be having more fun than if you are not playing the game. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I think uh, I think that'll do it for our questions. Okay. Let's take a take a moment. Mm-hmm. Let's take a deep breath slash yawn. <sighs> <clears throat> oh, I get so sleepy when I am tossing another log onto the funeral pyre. <laughs> It's funny that we're we're tired and yawning when we're recording during the day. <laughs> I know it's just because we're up earlier. I mean, not really. I would be I would be walking into work at the moment. If, right. If yeah. Was, anyway. No, like yeah, I've been I've been up since ten since like ten thirty. So. Oh, gotcha. I've been up since like one thirty. <laughs> um, all right. So our our funeral pyre submission today was from Kevin on Facebook. Uh-huh. Kevin says. Roll the barrel of guts down a hill to lure a green dragon in and slay it. Ooh. Plan worked extremely well. The first part, anyways. <laughs> so, so they yeah. lured in the dragon. But, but uh, uh, nothing else went according to plan. Right, right. <laughs> and, you know, we've we've all been there. Hey, dragons. I wasn't even didn't even plan that. He lured in a dragon. Oh. And then... Something went wrong. Something went wrong, right? <laughs> um, my question is: Is like, where do you get a pile? Of, where do you get a barrel of guts? Oh, you you clearly haven't been in this business for for very long, Jeff. <laughs> it's like, like, you know, did did they go and get a barrel and fill it with guts? Did they buy a barrel? They probably full of guts? Had, they probably had the guts first, and they were like, "Well, we now we got to buy a barrel. Let's just put it in a barrel." <laughs> I don't know, like. I, yeah, now now I want to know how did they how did they prep that and you know you roll a barrel of guts down a hill, oh my goodness! Now my I would imagine they rolled it down the hill so that it would crash against something and then there would be guts everywhere. Right. Far here's here's what I'm thinking. Far enough from the players that they can then shoot arrows or whatever at it. Yeah, sure. That's right. that's where my mind went. Rather than trying to sneak guts into a position. <laughs> I guess. It's yeah. like it's like, okay, like we have to we have to like sneak this barrel of guts that the you know that the dragon's gonna be able to smell or something. Sure, so sure. Like, Alright, so roll it down this hill and hopefully it gets far enough, you know, so that the dragon you know smells it or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, who's uh, guts? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Oh, what if what if it's actually Nickelodeon guts? Oh, it was actually a barrel of slime. It was. Barrel. It was actually they got the Are, they got the guts out of a giant nose. Wait, wait, no. We guts was the um. Oh no, no guts was like the uh, like. Or am the, I thinking of Double Dare? Yeah, you think of Double Dare. Oh. Guts was like the Olymp the like sort of like Olympics one. Didn't, wasn't there slime and I, and guts? I don't know if they had guts or if, or I, if they had okay. slime or anything. They had full, the, they did have the aggro crack. Ooh, okay. Full disclosure: I did not have Nickelodeon when I was a child. <laughs> I've never actually seen guts or Double Dare. <laughs> Yeah, no. I do apologize for yeah, setting that up without the, having the, the nose one the is knowledge. definitely Double Dare. Okay, uh, and then there's you're just like there's Double Dare and there's Family Double Dare and a lot of other ones. Um, but yeah, no guts was there. There was guts and there was global guts. Ooh. So like you know it, it was it was more like athletic competitions and stuff like that. And then like you know there was some like extra bits to it that made it like oh for kids, mm-hmm. you know like 
but yeah, the final event was you climbed the aggro crag, and it was just this like you know this like hellscape of like uh, an obstacle course like that was like on this like fake mountain thing. Okay, it was basically a bunch of like like one of those like fake mountain climbing walls, and then like there would be like these big foam barrels that like are not barrels, uh, uh boulders. Oh, okay. They what would, if they were barrels full of guts? Full of guts. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they would throw foam boulders down at guys. It was like, it's like that show. Oh, what was American it Gladiators? No, um, Most Extreme Elimination Challenge. Oh, okay, okay. But for kids. But for kids, right, <laughs> you know, right. Like it was kind of like that. It was just and like, in in English, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And but then there was Global Guts where they had um, participants from like other countries and stuff sure, like that. Sure, sure. And then like they had like the the panel of judges and stuff like that where they pulled up the numbers and that whole thing. Gotcha. All right. So, so it was apparently it is not a barrel of Nickelodeon guts. <laughs> right. But, but it's, it's it just was? it was a barrel full of like pieces of the aggro crag, which was like the trophy they got at the sure, end. Sure, sure. <laughs> All right. Uh well so so let's uh let's raise a glass in memory of this uh possibly gut vendor. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they sold maybe they were a butcher oh sure in their free time and then uh and then then they got killed by a dragon uh-huh. all right well so let's raise Was our it... glass in memory of this this uh this unnamed person with a uh, this un- this unnamed attempted dragon slayer okay. clink <laughs> maybe it was donkey kong through barrels whoa 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 maybe that's whoa. what's in the barrels that's what's in the barrels that's disgusting you just <laughs> dropped a lore bomb jeff <laughs> or a lore barrel <laughs> All okay. right. Uh, <laughs> to submit questions for us to discuss, items for the Dragon's Horde, or stories for the Funeral Pyre, please email us at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. For show notes, a running list of questions asked, and important links, go to interpartyconflict.com. Find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash interpartyconflict, or our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash interpartyconflict, where I post weekly discussion questions for you. We're also on Twitter at inpartyconflict. We're on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, YouTube, anywhere you download podcasts. Please rate, review, subscribe, or just tell a friend. If you feel like donating, you can go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. Check out our rewards, $1 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month. Anything you can spare would go towards making the show better, and you'll get some rewards in return. Jeff, you want to tell us about FriendQuest? FriendQuest is our YouTube channel where we play video games. We play uh, D&D stuff mostly, but yeah. uh, we, we have a couple other ones coming up. Cool. All right. And our music is made by Boxcat Games from Nameless the Hackers RPG. So, Jeff, until next time. Watch out for that barrel. Oh, no. Guts. <laughs> <laughs>